for my friend, the fabulous Karen Morgan. I was traveling a couple weeks ago. I went through the Atlanta airport and I saw a friend of mine from college and she, we hadn't seen each other in years and she came over, gave me this big old hug and she said, oh my God, how are you? And then she said, how was y'all's pandemic? <laughs> Like it was spring break. <laughs> also, like it was over. <laughs> and I don't, uh, how do you answer that? I don't know how you answer. How was y'all's pandemic? Oh, it was fun. How was yours? <laughs> you want to be conversational, right? Well, my pandemic started on March the 12th of 2020. Y'all maybe remember that date. We kind of think back to where we were on March 12th. March 12th, I had a comedy show that night that got canceled. And the next day, I went and drove and picked up all of my kids from college and brought them home. Yay. <laughs> and we were home together, all five of us, for the next 18 months. Yay. <laughs> they completely messed up my Netflix account. My Netflix account is so confused as to what I'm, I'm watching. Um, they like to get a clean glass every time they get something to drink. That's one of my favorite things. Every single time. Um, no one knows how to work the dishwasher, apparently. That's just a skill I have. No, it was fun. My day making it was fun. I, was, I had a great time. Um, we did have a few interesting milestones during the pandemic. We had two graduations, two family graduations. We had a high school graduation and a college graduation. My younger son was the lucky high school class of 2020. <laughs> yeah, I know. It was, it was so... They actually managed to have the kids go to the high school and they marched and they had their caps and gowns and they got to actually get their diplomas in person. And then the people who gave birth to them and made all those snacks for all those years and sat outside in the cold watching all those games for those years, we had to stay home and watch it online on the TV set in our pajamas drinking cocktails. <laughs> best graduation ever. I'm not even kidding. It was the best one ever. I called the high school. I'm like, y'all need to do this thing every year. We got hammered at my house. Hammered. My in-laws didn't have to come. I didn't have to get dressed. It was wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. And then, so that was June of 2020. And then, you know, then we're like, oh, we'll be over in the fall, right? Not the fall, it'll be over, right? So fall of 2020 was supposed to be my first empty nest fall. That was be the first fall in 21 years that all of them were out of my house. And then COVID stayed, right? <laughs> COVID stayed, and my younger one took a gap year. He stayed home. My daughter had online classes. She was a junior in college. She stayed home. My senior in college had online classes. He stayed home. You know, and it was, it was fine. We're, we're all good. It's fine. And, and the best part, the best part about online college classes, they cost the exact same amount of tuition. As if they were not in my home. It's all fine. No, it's really, it's all good. It's all good. Um, we did a few things. Keeping it, keeping it. Um, we did a few things, if y'all remember, when we first started being stuck at home. Some of us cleaned our houses, right? Some of us cleaned, we went a little crazy. Um, I was very happy because I already had this cleaning book. It was written by a lady named Marie Kondo. It's called The Magic of Tidying Up, Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up. Has tidying up ever changed your life magically? I don't think so. If you don't know this book, first of all, congratulations. <laughs> And if you do know it, here's what you do with Marie Kondo's magic of tidying up. You hold up your stuff, whatever it is, a shirt, a pants, a shoe, and you ask this magic question, does this spark joy? <laughs> and if the answer is yes, you get to keep it, right? And if the answer is no, you take it to goodwill. Now, sadly... The magic of tidying up by Marie Kondo only works on things, not people. <laughs> <laughs> or 
or else there would be a lot of people dropped off at Goodwill. That's just saying, teenagers particularly. So I cleaned out my closet. I did all the things with my clothes. I got rid of a bunch of stuff. And then my husband, I told him, I'm like, I'll help you with your clothes. We got through one of his shirts. (laughs) One shirt. I held it up. He goes, you want me to ask that shirt what? (laughs) Does that shirt spark joy? What does that even mean? Does it mean do I like it? I don't know. You bought it. (laughs) Do you think this shirt sparks joy for me? I didn't even know this shirt was in this closet. (laughs) This may not even be my shirt. Are you having an affair? It (laughs) didn't go well. Uh, The only person having an affair in our home is our dog. Um... (laughs) who thinks he's having the affair with me because uh, my husband won't let the dog sleep in the bed. And, and when my husband goes out of town, I let the dog sleep with me. He's, he's hairy, he snores. It's just like having my husband right there. <laughs> but when my husband comes back home, the dog knows he's a smart dog. He knows he's done wrong and broken the rules, right? So he, just, he won't even make eye contact with my husband. He just stares at the floor. <laughs> just, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I slept with your wife. I'm really sorry. (laughs) So one good thing about cleaning up during COVID was I found some stuff in our attic when I went up there to start cleaning some stuff out. I found this box of treasures um, that my mom had had done. And there's another cleaning method that my mom told me about. And she actually sent me this book. It's called Swedish Death Cleaning. (laughs) The Gentle Art of Swedish Death Cleaning. It's over in Sweden. It's called da- over there. <laughs> now, the premise behind Swedish death cleaning is that you're supposed to get rid of all your stuff before you die so you don't burden your loved ones with all your clutter, right? Which kind of makes sense. But I think it's like cleaning up after your family on your deathbed. And I've been doing this for way too long, and I am not doing it on my deathbed. I am so sorry. Before I die, I'm going to buy a giant warehouse. And I'm going to fill it with dirty laundry. (laughs) Just socks and towels and all the stuff that I pick up all the time. And then I'm going to take all my cash money and I'm going to hide it in all the dirty laundry. (laughs) So they have to go through all the laundry to find the money. And occasionally I'm going to put a note in there that says, see, ha ha, you should have picked up your socks. So my mom had sent me a whole bunch of stuff. I think she was doing her Swedish death cleaning. And in this box, I found a bunch of pictures. And and I'm going to share a couple with you. The first picture I will share with you, this is a picture of me when I graduated from law school. This is me in my cap and gown. And um, people don't know this necessarily, but before I became a comedian, I was a trial attorney. On my resume, this is a lateral move. Thanks very much. (laughs) So still working on that. Uh, I actually practiced law down in Atlanta before I moved up to Maine, and when I, I did criminal defense work and medical malpractice work, and the criminal defense work down in Atlanta was pretty, was pretty hard. And when I came to Maine, I found that the crime rate in Maine here is low. But when we have crime here, it's hilarious. <laughs> we had this Zumba lady down in Kenny Bunkport. Some of you may recall. So if you, if you didn't hear about her, she, I guess her Zumba class was not very popular and wasn't getting a lot of people, and she was trying to figure out how to pay the rent, so they just turned the Zumba class into a front for prostitution. <laughs> and then they all got kind of in trouble, they got arrested, and they shut them down. Well, one of the side effects has been, if you, if you now have a Zumba class in Maine, you might not want to call it Zumba. <laughs> Because people will either laugh or they'll think you're associated with prostitution. So we have things like dance fitness and exercise dance and we're not hookers. (laughs) One of my favorite criminal cases happened in Skowhegan. This was a few years ago. There was a young man who, I think this was winter time, and he had a little party by himself. You know, just one of those by yourself parties they have. And, you know, he had some, maybe some Allen's brandy, coffee brandy, and some pharmaceuticals, and just had a little party. And for some reason, he took off all of his clothing. 
every bit of his clothing, and he went on into his driveway, and he got into the dump truck that he drove for work. And he (laughs) drove his truck naked down the street to his neighbor's house. And I guess he didn't like his neighbor because he drove that dump truck right into the front wall of the neighbor's house and went through the went right through the front wall and then he got out of the truck naked and started to fight the guy. <laughs> it's Maine, I love it. He starts to fight the guy totally naked. Now the guy that lived in the house took out a hammer <laughs> and beat the daylights out of the naked man. And then when the police came, they took statements and they asked the guy with their hammer, they're like, we're just kind of curious about your hammer. He said, well, I was in my living room and thankfully I keep a hammer there. (laughs) Just for this kind of situation. (laughs) He said it on the news. I just love this. It was, it was like he went to the, the hardware store and said, hey, you know what? I'm looking for a tool for if I'm in my house and I'm in my Barker lounger and my boxer shorts watching the Patriots game and then a dump truck comes in the front of my house and a naked guy high on drugs gets out and starts to fight me, what kind of tool should I use for that? And they're like, oh, that's a number 12 ball-peen hammer. Here you go. Good luck to you, sir. So so I like to tell, particularly particularly young, young professional women or young women in school, that even though you have somebody you might work with that might be part of your team, and you, you, you look down the hall, you think, oh, that person's, they've got... They've got their act together. Look how they've got their life balance. They're balancing family. They're just doing it all. Just because they have this picture right here does not need, mean they have their act together. Because this person also has this picture. <laughs> and some of you may recognize this as a glamour shot. <laughs> from ni- Yes, we have glamour shots from 1985. <laughs> I don't even have I don't even have a joke for that. I don't even have a joke. For that. There's literally nothing funnier than this picture, except maybe that picture. Did you get Did you get this one with the with, we, we all wore this same jacket. They just passed it around the country. We all had the same exact jacket on. Clearly, they only had one pair of earrings at the one I went to. It just it's it's all. But I have to say, I, I would not want to trade places with her. I would not want to play trade places with her. I'm 57. I'm very happy about it. I might like to have her boobs back. I, I might like, because you know what? She had awesome boobs. She really did. And now what I've got, they're, they're like those little pillows that everybody has on their couch to watch television with. They're cute to look at on the couch, but if you lay down and then you sit back up, they don't poof back out at all. If you lay this way, they go underneath your armpit. What is that? Don't lay down on your back to watch TV because they go behind you. And my poor husband, he's, he's trying to get to second base. He's all up here. I'm like, honey, you know what? Second base has moved. It, it used to be in Maine. It is now in Alabama, and you need to figure out. There's a special GPS to find them at this point. And I try, oh my God, I try. Before COVID, I went to the gym all the time. I'm trying. Here's what I refuse to do at the gym. I refuse to update my music technology. Everybody at my gym has little ear pods and little things and their little tiny music things. And I still have a giant cassette tape Walkman. <laughs> And it works just fine. It's fine. If you put it in a fanny pack, you can walk on the treadmill with it. And you look kind of cool. You really do. So before COVID, I was at the gym and I'm walking and there was a little girl, the, uh, the little treadmill next to me, this little size two, size zero creature, little thing over here. And, and I could sort of feel her like watching me, you know, because I was taking my cassette tape out and turning it over. 
to side B, as one does. And she was fascinated with this relic of the past. And she got the courage up. She finally said, excuse me, is that a cassette tape? She couldn't even say the word right. And I'm like, I was, I was flattered there for a moment. I said, oh, yes, it's a cassette tape, yes. And then the little thing got judgmental. And she says, oh, does it really say exercise mixtape 1989 on it? And I said, yes, it does. And in 1989, my ass looked just like yours. I suggest you walk a little faster, Missy. <laughs> no, I try to, I, I run too, I occasionally run. Here's, I don't like the, the running races. If anybody does 5K running races, I have one for you to go try out, though. It's in my home state of Georgia. It's in Dawsonville, Georgia, and this is a real race. Dawsonville from Dawsonville. And are you from Dawsonville? Oh, my God. Okay, then you'll know this. Okay, so there's a 5K running race in Dawsonville. It is clothing optional (laughs) it is called the fig leaf 5k (laughs) it's a real thing you go you don't wear any shorts you don't wear a jog bra and people run along and all you hear is flappity 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 (laughs) 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 and that's the men so ew So one of the things we had to do during, uh, during COVID, my passport expired. I had to go get a passport picture made, and I was kind of in a hurry because they were backed up. And so I found out you can get your passport photos made at Walgreens now. So I just went down to Walgreens. I walked in. The guy was behind the counter. I said, hey, I need a passport picture done. And he, he was so annoyed. He was just like, bleh, bleh. He's like, he took the job to sell toothpaste, and now I'm making him run the Sears Portrait Studio or something. <laughs> So he goes, come with me. And so we walk over and he gets out this little plastic camera and he he stands me by this thing and goes, okay, one, two, three. And then I did y'all what I have done my whole life is somebody counts to three and holds up a camera. I smiled. Exactly. I smiled. And he went, no, no, you can't smile. This is a passport photo. It has to be a neutral expression. I said, hey, dude, I'm a smiley person. This is my neutral. (laughs) See, I'm happy. I'm sad. (laughs) I'm terrified. (laughs) I hate you. I'm a southern woman. They are all the same. Trust me on this. He goes, no, 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 you can't show your teeth. You can't show your teeth. And I said, hey, I wore a headgear in junior high school for four years around the back of my neck and over the top of my head. I am showing my teeth in this picture. And he went, no, you're not. So he comes out with a rule book now. And and there it was at the Walgreens passport photo rule book. And it said, you can't wear a hat and you can't close your eyes and you can't have a toothy smile. (laughs) So I was like, all right, it's in your rule book. So, okay. So we try again. He holds up the camera and he goes, one, two. And then I just opened my eyes real big. (laughs) And then I smiled real big. And then when he got to three, I just covered up my teeth like this. (laughs) (laughs) You know, this is my passport picture. I go through TSA and they're like, Ms. Morgan, are you under the influence of any drugs or medication? I'm like, yes, I am. I bought them at Walgreens. Thank you very much. Oh, my goodness. So um, I am a mom of three, three human beings. My, my husband is from Boston and I'm from Georgia. So our kids are bilingual. We're very proud. Very proud. When our oldest was learning how to drive, he'd say, hey, y'all, watch this. I'm fixing to pack the car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
My youngest child was born during the Kentucky Derby. I was actually in the delivery room down in Portland and giving birth to this child and watching the Kentucky Derby on TV all at the same time. And because he was the third baby, I had enough drugs in my system, I thought I was in the Kentucky Derby. (laughs) And Seabiscuit is now 19 years old. (laughs) You know, by the time you have three to show up early for the drugs, he was born May the 4th. I got there on April 1st and just refused to go home. (laughs) Just going to stay here and have him. And I I can't believe he's actually, he's actually in college now. It's amazing. And it seems like yesterday was his first day of kindergarten. That school bus pulled up in front of our house and I put my older son on the bus and I kissed him on the head. I got my middle girl on the bus and put her on the bus and kissed her on the head. I got little sea biscuit in his backpack. (laughs) And I got him on the bus and I kissed him on the head. And I'm not embarrassed to tell you, I was emotional and I cried. I actually cried. And then I got up onto the school bus and I tongue kissed the bus driver right on the mouth. (laughs) Oh my God, I love you so much. (laughs) Thank you so much for taking these people away from me just, just for a few hours so I can drink in peace. Thank you. (laughs) She was so surprised. She will not look at me in shawls. I'm not even kidding. <laughs> and I, I don't miss the little kid ages. I, I, will, I particularly don't miss some of the things we had to do as, as mothers at, at school. Like, there was always one mother in my kid's classroom every year. That one overprepared birthday party planning, organic snack making, annoying mother. And you all know her. You all do. <laughs> Y'all are pointing at each other. <laughs> And if you don't know her, you are her. So be very careful. <laughs> be careful. And they used to have these things that, like, Seabiscuit had a Valentine's Day party. A Valentine's Day party, and immediately the, the mothers, everybody had to sign up for the snacks. Sign up for the snacks. And they're all signing up for, oh, Monica will bring hand-dipped strawberries. <laughs> and Joshua will make homemade organic Chex Mix. And I'm looking around my kitchen, I'm like, all right, Seabiscuit's going to bring... Funyuns and Bloody Mary mix. So. <laughs> Happy Valentine's, people. I hate you all. So, um, And then there was... The, the, the school had this thing called No Name Calling Week. And I was like, what stupid idiot came up with that? <laughs> really? And then they called us because they wanted the parents to stand on the playground and monitor No Name Calling Week. And I was like, can I smoke? <laughs> because that's what it's going to take for me to stand out here. And then they have a thing, and it was called Turn Your TV Off Week. A real thing, and I was like, no. And one of those mothers said, oh, Karen, listen, it's important so you can spend more quality time with your family. I was like, that's why we bought the television. And then she just kept pushing it, and she said... Oh, well, you know, you need to re- really worry about the development of your children's brains and their, and their screen time. I said, hey, Joshua's mother, come here. Let me tell you something. No one likes you. <laughs> or your Chex Mix. <laughs> and then they grow up. They get to the next stage of teenage years, which are a whole nother bag of fun, Right. Um, they say that girl teenagers are harder to deal with than boy teenagers. I see some nods, right? And, and they're right. They're actually right. Because I think girl teenagers are just adult women in training. They have all the raw ingredients of adult women. Disdain, spite, <laughs> revenge, a few irrational thoughts, great intelligence. But they haven't yet learned how to put all their evil powers to good yet. So they're like the furniture people in front of the, the, the windsock people in front of the furniture store that go up and down. You're like, <laughs> they go up, they go down. You don't know when or why. Just <laughs> they look almost human, but they're not. <laughs> they're not. You have a girl teenager. Yes, you do. Now, boys. 
boys, boys are actually, as teenagers, I think a little more fun to hang out with. They are. But they smell. <laughs> they just do. They smell. There's a funk. And I don't know why, because they shower a lot. <laughs> for extended periods of time. <laughs> they should be clean, and that is all I'm saying. And I didn't know this about teenage brains until I had teenagers. The teenagers' brains, their frontal lobes literally have not stopped forming in their head. They're still growing together like this. So they basically have a brain that is in their skull just bleh, just bleh, just whopping around in there, right? Bleh. So what you get with a boy teenager particularly is you get a good choice and then a good choice and then a good choice and then a doofus choice. <laughs> A good choice and a doofus choice. If you get two doofus choices in a row, your insurance premiums go up. <laughs> Happened to me. My youngest doofus was Seabiscuit, and um, he had this little phase where he was becoming a doomsday prepper. <laughs> if you don't, I guess people think the end of the world is coming, and so they start putting survival supplies in the basement. And I decided I was just letting him watch too many episodes of The Walking Dead because he was putting all this stuff down there. And so I made fun of him forever. I'm like, you know, this is hilarious, and I'm making fun of you. And then I thought, ooh, what if the zombies really come? <laughs> Our family's survival depends on the choices of this 15 year old boy. So we're just going to be sitting in a basement in Cumberland, Maine, surviving off of Blue Mountain Dew and <laughs> flaming Hot Cheetos and reading a lot of Victoria's Secret catalogs. <laughs> Help us. And then the next, the next phase, which I'm still kind of in right now, is they go off to college and... Um, the dorm shopping thing between the boys and the girls, to me, was, the, I think, one of the most jarring differences. When my older son... Went for his freshman year in college. I took him to Bed Bath & Beyond to get all of his dorm room supplies. First of all, he had never even been in Bed Bath & Beyond. He thought the sheets and towels just came with our house. <laughs> so we go in there with his dorm room supply list, and they, I said, okay, you need extra long twin sheets for your dorm room. They have gray, white, or pink. He said, I want white. I said, you're getting gray. <laughs> We're going to start off with a color that they're just going to end up at at the end of the school year. <laughs> Put those in the buggy. And then he goes to me, wait, wait, wait. What's the thread count on those? <laughs> and I was like, do you even know what thread count means? He said, yeah. No. <laughs> but the highest is the best, right? I'm like, okay, first of all, these are dorm room sheets. They're not the best. They're the worst. But it doesn't matter what the thread count is because these sheets are not coming back to my house. <laughs> I don't want to see these sheets ever again. I don't want to know what happens on these sheets for the next nine months. It doesn't matter what the thread count is at the bottom of the garbage dumpster. Just put them in that buggy. So I said, next thing you got to have, you need a pillow. So he goes into the pillow section of Bed Bath & Beyond, which is a big choice variety. He comes back with this pillow. He goes, I want this one. It's made of organic bamboo fronds and baby gosling feathers. It's only $200. I selected a different pillow. I said, you see this one? It's made from polyester. It's only $6. And when you puke red hunch punch up all over it, it will be less sad at the bottom of the garbage dumpster. Put it in the buggy. So the next year, I had to get my daughter ready to go off to college. Now, my son, he, he took the disposable sheets and the $6 pillow, and he, like, grabbed a towel out of the dirty clothes on the way out the door. My daughter furnished a luxury high-rise condominium. <laughs> you had one, too. I, I, I always... We had... We had all this matching bedding. We had mood lighting. Everything had to match. Everything had to be exactly right. Even the marker board that they put on the outside of the door so their roommates can write notes to each other had to be exactly right. And I said, honey, you know, you're in a co-ed dorm. It does not matter how cute this marker board is because boys are just going to draw dicks all over it. <laughs> Do 
doesn't matter how cute it is. That's what's going to happen to it. So then she wanted a husband pillow. She had to have a husband pillow with the little arms things. And so I'm like, honey, you know, we all think we want a husband pillow. And then we get the husband pillow. And then we realize the husband pillow takes up way too much space in the bed. And it just sits there in front of the television. (laughs) You don't really need that. So my husband, Pillow, and I just celebrated our 25th wedding anniversary. <laughs> Yay! We made it. So the, the traditional gift for 25 ma- years of marriage is silver. The modern and more appropriate gift is a ride home from your colonoscopy. <laughs> Which you really need more than some silver, quite honestly. No, we've been married a long time. When we got married, we saved the top tier of our wedding cake to eat it on our first anniversary. Some people do that. Um, The bakery that made our wedding cake actually gave us a fresh top so we wouldn't have to eat the old, you know, year old piece of cake. But I'm a little superstitious. I am. I'm I'm Southern. I'm just, I just didn't want to throw away the real top of our wedding cake. Yo, we've been married 25 years. We still have the top tier of our wedding cake (laughs) in our freezer. We've moved eight times, <laughs> and we've, we've lost power a whole bunch of times, and I'm afraid at this point, this quarter-century-old piece of poisonous wedding cake is the only magic holding the whole thing together. <laughs> so I'm keeping it. I'm absolutely keeping it. I'll give a little example of, of my, my husband and why we've been married so long. I, I, I'm not a nagger. I, you, know, you have to pick your battles. I don't nag. I'm just not a nagger. So one, one evening, my, my son came in to borrow my hair dryer out of my bathroom. And he came and he grabbed it so hard that he broke the outlet that the hair dryer was in. My husband came home from work. And I said, hey, he broke the outlet. Can you fix my hair dryer outlet? And he said something to the effect of, bleh, <laughs> kids, bleh, house, bleh, bourbon. And so... And I know I've told him. He knows I've given him the information. I'm not a nagger. He's got it all in there. Oh, I have to also say that um, my husband builds houses for a living. So (laughs) the things in our house are always broken. We had one particular house that he never put doorknobs in the doors in the upstairs. So we just had circle holes. (laughs) Just circle holes. I'd just be trying to go to the bathroom, and the kids were like, Mom, 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 Mom. <laughs> Literally, we sold the house. He put the doorknobs in the next day. I'm like, thanks so much. So I told him, so he's got the information. He knows it's broken, right? I've asked him if he could fix it. I don't want to be a nagger. I'm not going to do that. Next day, he hadn't fixed it, so I had to go in the bedroom and squat down to the outlet that's on the floor to dry my hair. So I'm squatting and drying my hair, and I'm glaring and squatting. I will, I will admit, I'm glaring and squatting. I did this for like two weeks. Still didn't fix it. I went to his truck, and I got this extension cord that they use on job sites. It's, it's like a big yellow thing. It looks like a snake. It's huge. And I put it like through his pillow and... Like all through his shoes and just all, and, and just across the bed. So the, ma- the man knew there was an issue, right? <laughs> Two more weeks with this, right? So now I'm going on a month without my outlet being fixed, but I'm not a nagger. I didn't nag, I didn't say anything. Finally, he comes in and goes, Karen, listen, I kind of need my extension cord back for work. <laughs> and I was so proud of myself. I said very calmly, I will give your extension cord back if you will fix my outlet. And the man said to me, why didn't you tell me it was broken? (laughs) And this is how murder suicides happen. (laughs) 
out of myself that I didn't murder him when he became a vegan for about three weeks. That was really bad. So he, he, a few summers ago, he said, I'm going to go vegan. I'm like, that's a terrible idea, but okay, do whatever you want to do. So he would get up at 6.30 in the morning and he'd put all these fruits and vegetables in this blender and it would all go together and just came out as this gray paste. It all was awful. And he, he would try to get me to drink it. He's like, hey, I made this one with kale and wheatgrass and almond milk. Try it. I'm like, no. Don't you want to be healthy? No. I want bacon. That's what I want. Well, I made it with almond milk. It tastes like a milkshake. I'm like, no, it does not. It tastes like grass clippings. And what you need to know, though, is just because you put the word milk after the word almond does not make it milk. And the dairy farmers are very upset about this. They want us to call almond milk what it really is, nut juice. I am not even making that up. <laughs> nut juice. Ooh, I'd like to have a tall, cold glass of nut juice. Mm. Ooh, I'd like to dip my Oreo cookies in some nut juice. Ew. Ew. Uh, so Tara's talking about being in her 50s. I'm in my, I'm 57. I'm, I will tell you, I'm happy being over 50. It's the greatest thing ever. It's the most wonderful thing ever. I have, as I've gotten older, my magazine subscriptions have changed a little bit. I used to get People magazine. I don't get People anymore because I don't know any of the people in People. <laughs> Who are these people? I don't know. I don't care. I stopped getting Cosmo a long time ago because they had those little, those little sex quizzes in there. <laughs> What's your love-making style? I don't know. I got three jobs and three kids, and um, here's my love-making style. <sighs> you want to do what? <laughs> like, right now? I have so much to do. I have a list, and you're not on it. Sorry. <laughs> My favorite magazine right now is called Garden and Gun. And it's a real magazine. It's a real magazine. Dawsonville, you may know Garden and Gun. Garden and Gun is a real magazine for middle-aged Southern women who want to pull weeds and contemplate who we want to shoot right in the head. And it's true, middle-aged women, we want to shoot at least five people in the head every single day. We do. But we don't do it, right? That's wrong. That's murder. So what do we do when we have murderous thoughts? We call our friends and we go to our walking groups. <laughs> just go, and you'll see middle-aged women, we're walking in pairs and fours down the street and everybody's just walking. Just, uh, uh, we're just getting it all out. Just, uh. <laughs> and my husband was like, why don't you just go for a run by yourself? I'm like, I can't. We're saving lives. <laughs> This is why serial killers are always men. They don't have a walking group to go to. So they have all these bad thoughts and it just comes out as murder. We prevented three murders in this neighborhood alone this morning. And one of them was yours. Um, I also ride, I have a road bike, I ride a bike, and I kind of enjoy that. That's kind of a fun thing to do. And uh, my husband bought me this bike for my birthday a couple years ago. He sent me down to the bike shop down in Portland. He said, go in there, pick whichever one you want, I'll pay for it, that'll be your birthday present. So I went to the bike shop. This young man, very nice young man named Curtis, 21, maybe 22 years old, waited on me. He said, oh, it's great. Ride the bikes in the parking lot, come back in, tell me how you like it, and we'll, we'll go from there. So I, I found this bike. I said, Curtis. I like this bike. I want to buy this bike, but I don't like this bicycle seat. It hurts me. <laughs> and he was great. He, that's all I had to say. He picked it right up on it. He goes, oh, no, no, we can change out the seat. So he goes back to the, show, uh, the storeroom and he comes back with this other seat that was a very similar seat to the one I just got off of. It's, it, but it was like this plastic seat with a little narrow groove down the middle. <laughs> He goes, see, this one's for girls. 
I said, yes, Curtis, this one is for girls, young, virtuous girls. I'm neither of those things. I have created three human beings inside my body. And I have pushed them out of the part of my body that's going to be sitting on this bicycle seat. So what I'm going to need you to do, Curtis, is find me a seat that's got a big, wide seat. Preferably with some springs and a soothing gel insert. Because this part of my body needs a vacation, Curtis. And Curtis turned right red, red and ran away. He just ran away. And he came, and he came back, and I, I thought Curtis was coming back. But no, here comes the owner of the store, who was a guy about my age who I kind of know. He said, Curtis says you have a question. I was like, yes, I have a question. I like this bike. I want to buy this bike, but I don't like this bicycle seat. It hurts me. He goes, how many kids do you have? And I said, three. He goes, I'll be right back. So he goes to the back room and he comes out with the holy grail bicycle seat. It was beautiful. It just it had all that stuff and the soothing gel insert. He goes, he goes, here, I think you'll like this one. My wife, Barbara, has this one. I think she's in your walking group. It's free. It's free. It's free. Um, I, also, I also swim at the Y. Um, I, I like going to the Y. There's a lady that swims at the Y with us who is in, I think she's in her 80s. She swims all the time, and she's so inspirational because I, I want to be an active senior, and I want to be able to swim when I'm her age. But she's one of these people who does not think she needs a towel in the locker room. <laughs> And I think everybody needs a towel in the locker room. They're not heavy. Just get a towel. So the last time I was there a few weeks ago, she came in and she'd been swimming. She got her shower, came in the locker room filled with people, no towel, right? She goes over to her, the locker to get her clothes on. And she, she leans over to her L.L. Bean tote bag. And she starts getting dressed, and she puts on a, a turtleneck sweater, and then she buttons that up, and then she puts on a, another sweater on top of that. And so from the waist up, she was completely dressed. From the waist down, just nothing, okay? <laughs> and then with her back turned to a room filled with other women, she turned and bent over <laughs> and started rummaging through her L.L. Bean tote bag. And she's rummaging, 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 rummaging. It's what we all hoped would be her underpants. <laughs> rummaging, rummaging, rummaging. And then, she's, then she says, I know I had panties on when I came in here. <laughs> because I went to the grocery store first. <laughs> Which makes me love her even more. Not only she's inspirational, she's an active senior, she's a lady. She knows that ladies don't go commando at the grocery store. She knows. She knows. Uh, so I, I swam uh, the Peaks to Portland a few years ago for the first time. If you don't know about that race, you, you take the ferry over to Peaks Island, and then you swim in the, o- the open water, and you come back to, to Portland. And I signed up for it, and you have to have a kayaker to swim with you. Um, I guess if so they can find your body or kind of where, you know. So I came home, I signed up for it, I told my husband, I'm like, hey, um, would you be my kayaker for Peaks to Portland? He said, sure. I, I just have one question. I said, what is that? He goes, can I fish while I'm doing it? <laughs> he caught three stripers. It was great. So I see that we have a lot of generations here tonight, which makes me very, very happy. I think... It's very, it's very interesting in the news. We're hearing a lot of generations fighting amongst each other, right? It's kind of weird. Like the, the baby boomers are hating the millennials, and the millennials are not liking Gen Z. And it's kind of confusing who, which group you're supposed to be in and also who you're supposed to hate. <laughs> so I'm going to clear it all up tonight. I'm going to give everybody a primer about all of our generations and who you, which group you're in. 
So our oldest generation right now is called the silent generation. And these guys were born between the 1920s and 1940s. Uh, They're called the silent generation because when they were children, they were to be seen and not heard. These are my in-laws. These are people that are afraid of the microwave oven and cook with lard. (laughs) They're lovely people. My in-laws have been married for 64 years. 64 years. Crazy. And apparently, if you've been married that long, you no longer have the ability to hear the sound of the other person's voice. (laughs) Because when I go to their house, they both talk at me at the same exact time. Two completely separate conversations, as if the other one is not even there. And and they're sweet people. I don't want to be rude. So I kind of go back and forth between both conversations, which is... Like having a conversation with somebody with a lazy eye. You don't know. You don't know which one to get in. Or, you know, I don't know which is the right one. So, I generally stick with my father-in-law. He's more fun. He likes to talk about the war against the squirrels in their backyard. This man is fighting a squirrel war. He has put aluminum sheeting up all over the trees. He has spent about $3,000 to save maybe $4 worth of bird food. And he has electrified their bird feeders. There's an electric current running through the bird feeder, and the thing spins around, so the squirrel will just get up there just trying to get lunch, and just... And my father-in-law is the happiest man on earth. He sits out there all day with the binoculars, just... Here he comes, here he comes. Woo, there he goes. And they made fun of my southern family at the wedding. I'm like, that's the most redneck thing I've ever heard in my life. (laughs) Cannot believe it. So the next generation down are the baby boomers. This is my mom's generation. They were born between the 1940s and mid-60s. The baby boomers perfected smoking. They were the all-star smokers. They smoked at home. They smoked at work. They smoked in the hospital, in like in the hospital bed. They smoked at McDonald's. They smoked at restaurants like between bites of food. And they smoked with their kids in the car with the windows rolled up very tightly. <laughs> we were still still here. So now for some reason, whatever, I don't know. The boomers hate the millennials. I don't know why. And to be fair, everybody hates the millennials. <laughs> And, and I think this is because they came up with the word artisanal, right? And, it, and I think that they came up with things like avocado toast, and so everybody hates them. And it's not fair. It's not fair, millennials. It's not fair. You're douchey. It's not fair. <laughs> it's not your fault. You're douchey. It's not. It's because your Star Wars has Jar Jar Binks in it, and there's just no coming back from that. I apologize. <laughs> Now, it doesn't matter because the millennials at this point are all getting married and having babies so their lives are over, and it doesn't matter anymore. So, okay. um, Now, after the millennials come Gen Z. Gen Z was born between 1995 and 2015. Gen Z are my kids. Good luck, America. <laughs> Gen Z does not know how to write a check. They do not know how to address an envelope. They do not know how to read a paper back, a map. They don't know how to read cursive writing. I have to interpret their grandparents' birthday cards like it's a foreign language. They can't get anywhere if there's not a GPS on their phone either. All I'm saying is that if if Gen Z takes over the world, it's going to be pretty easy to get it back. going to write our battle plans in cursive on a piece of paper (laughs) and then mail it to ourselves in envelopes. (laughs) Did I forget anybody? Any generations did I forget? X, thank you. Thank you. I did not forget Gen X because I am the first year of Generation X. Here's who forgot Generation X, CBS News. CBS News did a story on all the generations last year. They listed off silent generation, the boomers, and then they just skipped over 65 million people and went to the millennials and the post-millennials. But here's all you need to know about Gen X. We don't care. (laughs) 
We don't care. We don't care that you left us off your little list, CBS News. And can't, in fact, we kind of like it. We're like the secret dive bar that only the locals know about. <laughs> we don't have to advertise, and we're never going out of business. We, don't, we never use sunscreen, right? We never had to use sunscreen. We just laid out on giant sheets of aluminum foil <laughs> with baby oil and iodine and Hawaiian Tropic Red Label. We sprayed sun in our hair and it was orange, we don't care. We are the latchkey kids that were raised by divorced boomer parents. We sat in the way, way back seat of our mom's station wagon, rear facing at the people behind us. Just waving. Just waving, that's all we were doing. Nobody wore a seat belt, not even in the front seat. If your mom's arm wasn't strong enough, you deserve to go through the windshield. We didn't have helicopter parents. In fact, we had the opposite of helicopter parents. We had Home Depot parents, which is where you think there should be someone in the store there that could help you, but no one's around. You're on your own. This is Home Depot, right? Do you need a skill saw where there's only one left in the whole store and it's way up there? Good luck in finding yourself a ladder, my friend. Go up there and get it and don't pull it over on yourself and cut your arm off because no one's going to take you to the hospital. In fact, it's going to be your fault that you got hurt. Here's what we got. Suck it up. Blow on it. Stop your crying. Walk it off. Welcome to Home Depot. (laughs) That's what we got. Nobody cared if we were bored. Nobody cared what our grades were. Nobody cared that we were eating lunch out of a lunchbox that was filled with rust. (laughs) Nobody cared that we were being pummeled in the face by real red rubber dodgeballs. The real ones, the ones that hurt and went twang when they hit you. Not the little foamy baby ones that they have now. No, we had the real red ones that left a crosshatch print on your forehead. Nobody cared. Nobody came to our athletic practices. Nobody brought sliced oranges. Certainly no one was arranging a play date. My mom arranged a play date. At 8 o'clock in the morning, my mama would say, y'all, go outside, boom, and play. Exactly. Play. And we were outside all day. She would lock the door. She would not let us back in. We were outside all day. We didn't have anything to eat. We didn't have anything to drink. We didn't have a juice box or any goldfish crackers. If we were thirsty, where would we drink out of? The hose. Yes. Yes. And that water was hot. But we're all still here. We're never going out of business. And what were we doing outside? We were trying to kill each other. We had rock fights. We had dirt clawed fights. We had green pine cone fights. And we had BB gun fights. We were shooting each other with BB guns. And our parents completely knew about it. There were some rules. There were actually, you know, there were some rules. Like three pumps max. That was one. No intentional headshots. It wasn't anarchy, for God's sake. And on holidays, we upped our game. We had bottle rocket wars and Roman candle wars. It was wonderful. And all my dad ever said was, don't aim it directly at your brother's face. That was it. We rode our big wheels out in the street. We made bicycle ramps with plywood that had nails in it. We were evil Knievel going over those cinder blocks. Nobody wore a bike helmet. And we're all still here. We're never going out of business. Now, sometimes my mom would give us money. She said, I will give you all some money to go down to the candy store to buy yourself some candy if you will bring me back some cigarettes. Yes. Yes. I was nine years old. I could go up to the counter and say... 
I'd like a carton of Merit Menthol 100 Delta Lights, please. <laughs> and they would sell them to me. And then at some point, you had to have a note. <laughs> so my mom would write a note. It would say, Dear Store, please sell my daughter cigarettes. Love, Mom. And, and then, <laughs> that was all it took. That was it. So she, w- she would give us money. She wouldn't let us back in the house. She, like, slid it under the screen door. We were, we were not coming back in. She was inside, like, drinking and watching Dark Shadows. I'm not really sure. She would not let us back in. So she'd give us the money, and we would leave our yard just totally unaccompanied by an adult. No helmet, no bubble wrap, and we would leave. And we would walk for miles, miles and miles alone down to the store. But we would stop on the way at the playground, which was a very different playground than my kids' little Gen Z playground. So my kids' Gen Z playground had wood chips all over the ground. So the child, if the child falls, they won't get a bruise on them, right? We had a giant sheet of cement, just... A slab of cement. You bro- fell, you broke your arm. Welcome to the playground. Just suck it up. We, we had equipment that would kill you. We had the swing set that if you had everybody on it at the same time, the legs came up out of the ground. It was just our goal to decapitate somebody in the group. We had the whirly gig thing that spun around, and you remember you would run, you would jump, and there was always one friend that just didn't make it. <laughs> they got sucked up in the rain hole somehow. <laughs> Save yourself! <laughs> we had the thing on a spring, like a horsey or a, a, a duck, you know, they go back and forth, and you literally would go all the way back to the back of your head. <laughs> hit your face. Hit your head. Hit your face. So much fun. <laughs> and our horsey part came off. We had a metal knob that went back. <laughs> no one ever fixed it. <laughs> Suck it up. Welcome to the playground. That's what we got. And then we had a slide. Now, my kids' little Gen Z slide at their Mabel I. Wilson School in Cumberland, Maine, was this little green Kirby thing. It just it in a nice soft pile of wood chips at the bottom. Our Gen X slide was just big metal slide, right? Just sat there in the sunshine. Just heating up. Athens, Georgia in August. Until it was not a slide anymore, it was a broiler pan for your ass. summer shorts on, so half your bottom is hanging out anyway, so we just... (laughs) So we would eventually leave with our burns and our wounds, and we would go down to the candy store to finally get the cigarettes and the candy. We'd go in there, and Gen X candy was mean candy. It was mean. We had candy like atomic fireballs. You couldn't even eat it. Who could keep it in your mouth the longest? That was all you could eat. Lemon heads, just... Pixie sticks. It was a it was a straw filled with sand and sugar. And then you'd try to eat it, but your spit would make it stick together. Totally glued together. So what do we do? Eat it. We eat the whole thing. And then at some point, these weren't big enough. We had the big plastic one. Just <laughs> the PVC pipe filled. I'm amazed nobody asphyxiated on a pixie stick does. We had the, fire, the entire family of wax candies, right? We had wax lips and the wax bottles that came in four flavors, right? Red, orange, blue, and green all tasted exactly the same. And you're supposed to bite it off and drink the little juice out, and then you're supposed to chew the, the bottle when you're done, which was like eating a birthday candle. <laughs> Yay! And then there was the wax paper family that, like a bit of honey or an hour later, we had wax paper wrapped around a block of something, and you could almost get all the paper off. <laughs> but there was always that one piece that just got jammed up in there by the machine. <laughs> so what do we do with that? Eat it. Yes, we did. 
We're eating wax and paper. And don't get me started on that tape filled with dots. That's (laughs) true. That's just mean. There's no way you're going to eat that and not ingest more paper than candy. This is awful. (laughs) Then there was the family of jewelry candies. We had the ring pops and the necklaces. I like the necklaces because they came on a little rubber band about that big. And then you can kind of squish it over your head like this. And then you're supposed to eat it like this. So you just have this rainbow of spit just dripping. Just a spit rainbow. So pretty. So pretty. So then we would go over to the counter and get my mom's real cigarettes, but we would also buy ourselves some candy cigarettes. Oh, don't we miss them? Oh, my God. They came in two varieties. There was the hard white stick that was just a stick of sugar with red on the end there because someone painted fire on there for us to eat. And then there was the bubblegum kind that you could take out of that pack and you could blow it out of smoke. We just sat there, just in front of the Handy Andy store, just wearing our candy jewelry, just smoking our candy cigarettes. Maybe a Zumba class in our future. We were nine-year-old candy hookers. And my mom had no idea where we were. But we're still here, and we're never going out of business. 